We slow down again in our progress through Galatians to cover only 11 verses this week because these are 11 thick verses. Paul arrives at the last episode in his narrative. This is the conflict in Syrian Antioch caused by the arrival of more conservative Jewish Christians from Jerusalem, men who were quite probably connected with James, the Lord's brother. These visitors, or were they inspectors, did not say that Gentiles needed to be circumcised and essentially to become Jewish in order to be saved. But they did say that Jews in Christ still needed to keep the law of Moses and observe the barriers it enforced between the people of God and the Gentiles, including Christian Gentiles. They convinced Peter to change his practice for the good of the cause. The other Jewish Christians in Syrian Antioch followed Peter's lead, of course. Even Barnabas caved in to the pressure. One scholar, C.K. Robertson, called this, even Barnabas, the saddest phrase in Scripture. Indeed, one can hear Paul's deep disappointment that his ministry partner, Barnabas, did not stand up with Paul, but became part of the problem. Paul's public challenge to Peter is the immediate context for the remainder of this paragraph, some of the densest argumentation in any of Paul's letters. A great deal more attention and theological weight tends to be given to verses 15 to 16 than to the remainder of the paragraph. These two verses announce the great theme of justification by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, that loomed so large in the Reformation and in Protestant theology ever since. A major scholarly debate churns specifically around these two verses. This is because justification, how we come to stand acquitted before a righteous God, is such an important theological topic. The question is, what does Paul mean by the Greek expression pistis Christu? This question actually has two parts. What is the meaning of the Greek word pistis here? Does it mean faith, as in trusting, or faithfulness, as in the moral quality of showing steadfastness towards someone? And then, what is the sense in which the second noun, Christu, Christ, describes the first noun? Is Christ the object of our faith, or is Christ the one showing faith or faithfulness? Quite a few scholars have jumped on the fairly recent bandwagon of saying that we are justified on the basis of the faithfulness Christ showed and not on the basis of our own trust in Jesus. This has some merit. The basis for our salvation is indeed what Christ did for us on the cross, not something that we do or show. However, the grammatical and stylistic arguments in favor of the traditional reading trust in Christ, seem to me to be overwhelming. This doesn't mean that my own trust justifies or saves me. It does mean that trusting Jesus and not taking up the Torah-driven life has opened me up to what will justify me. I would wish for the rest of the paragraph to play a larger role in our thinking about justification. This is because Paul gives us a picture of the justified life in verses 19 through 20, when he writes, It's not me living anymore, but Christ is living in me. What I'm now living in the flesh, I'm living by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up on my behalf. When Christ, the righteous one, is doing the living in me, then I'm aligned with God's righteousness. When God can recognize His Son in me, then I can have confidence that I will stand acquitted before God's judgment seat. And this is precisely what Christ died and the Spirit came to accomplish in each one of us. Paul returns us to the point at issue in 221. God's grace is at stake here. If aligning our lives with the law of Moses was the way to be found righteous in God's sight on the last day, Why in heaven's name did the Son of God endure the brutal and degrading death of the cross? We need to be careful how we answer this because a wrong answer means a false gospel. 
the rival teachers had an answer. Jesus died so that our sins against God's law would be forgiven and we could be cleansed for a fresh start in the Torah-driven life. What is our answer? Is it Jesus died so that our sins, past, present, and future, wouldn't keep us from enjoying eternal life with God? If so, we will need to pay attention to the rest of Galatians very carefully because we don't yet understand just how important the work of the Holy Spirit within us is for God's plan of setting us right. These paragraphs, once again, raise some important questions for us as we examine ourselves in light of God's Word. When has public opinion driven you off course from walking in alignment with God's vision for you and your faith community? It's one of the most basic compromises of discipleship that we make. Christ or the Spirit or the Scriptures are calling me to move in this direction, but I fear what people will think of me if I do, so I don't go nearly so far, if at all. When have you or those around you Taking, taken to putting back in place the lines, the divisions, the practices that the Holy Spirit dismantled. The Spirit erased the lines between Christians of any sort, have issues of immigration, or concerns about people coming from Arab countries raised them again. The Spirit breaks down walls that stand in the way of mission and outreach. Have you found reasons not to reach out to certain people? or to avoid crossing certain boundaries to advance God's cause. To what extent can you say with Paul, it's not me doing the living anymore, but Christ is the one living in me. When we're honest before God, we know the difference. When I'm looking out for others' interests and investing myself in God's agenda, it's Christ living in me. When I'm looking out for my interests and protecting my agenda rather than submitting it to God's, it's my ego taking over again. To what extent are you perhaps setting aside God's grace by not allowing Christ's death for you to achieve God's full purposes for you? Many Christians know and celebrate the fact that Jesus' death brings us forgiveness and acceptance again before God. Paul says that God seeks to accomplish considerably more through Christ's death. Paul says that if righteousness comes through the Torah, then Christ died for nothing. The implication is that righteousness, which doesn't come through aligning ourselves with the Torah, does come somehow through the death of Jesus. Once again, this will point us to the work of the Holy Spirit in us and among us, as we will discover as Paul's letter unfolds.